Make up mine. Boy, that Nintendo Direct got me hot and bothered, and it made me want to talk about the Nintendo Switch and its games. And did you guys know that Wikipedia has lists for virtually every major video game console, discussing every game for the console that sold more than a million units? These lists are really interesting to me, and I wanted to make a video talking about the best-selling Switch games for a while, so in this video, we're going to discuss in detail the 85 Nintendo Switch games that have sold more than a million units according to this list. We're gonna go through each game individually, give a a brief summation as to why I think it's managed to push over a million units, why it's stagnated as of now, and in some cases why it continues to sell like hotcakes. It is worth noting that the information for some of these games is a little bit outdated, like for a lot of games we're getting active sales numbers every time Nintendo's quarterly report comes in, whereas others we only got an update once it reached a million units and then nothing else, but all we can really go on is what's listed on this Wikipedia page, so just bear in mind that for some games the numbers might be a little bit outdated. It's also worth noting that the Nintendo Switch has sold a lot of games. For example, the best-selling PlayStation 2 game, which is the best-selling console of all time, only has sold about 17 million units, whereas the eight best-selling Nintendo Switch games have surpassed it. So while the Nintendo Switch is obviously not the best-selling video game console of all time, it likely never will be, it is certainly the console with the biggest install base of its users actively buying its games. That's really interesting to me. Let's try to figure out why in this video. Starting us off for this list, we have seven games that are listed as having sold a million point zero units as of right now. Some of these games are very outdated and have likely sold more, but our last metric was developers announcing that they had pushed over a million units, so we really don't have much else to go on. The first one is Thief Simulator, which is very obvious as to why this has pushed more than a million units if you've ever browsed a Nintendo eShop. This is one of those games that constantly goes on sale for only a few dollars, and before Nintendo instated that rule that made it so games on the eShop couldn't go below $2 for their price, it often went on sale for even less. This is a very easy game for people with some gold points or just a few dollars left over on their eShop balance to impulse buy, because it's almost always on sale for $2. Next up is Story of Seasons Pioneers of Olive Town, which I'm happy and surprised has sold a million units. There are a lot of farming games on Switch, it's kind of a meme, and while this game was a bit earlier to the punch, releasing in February of 2021, it's still a nice little pleasant game that I'm sure a lot of people are really big fans of the Story of Seasons Last Harvest Moon series. Well, not as big as Animal Crossing has always had a bit of a captive audience, so I'm very happy and pleasantly surprised that this game has pushed more than a million units. Next up is Shin Megami Tensei 5, which is another game I'm very happy has managed to push a million units. I know this is one of those games that people wanted to come out for ages. I believe this game was announced at the first Nintendo Switch showcase and didn't release until 2021, so while I'm sure a lot of people had fatigue from the wait and it might not have sold as much as it would have had it released earlier, it's still very cool to see this beloved series manage to push over a million units on Switch. Next up is Fitness Boxing 1 and 2, which despite releasing two years apart, have both managed to push 1 million units exactly. These are not surprising at all, fitness games on Nintendo consoles tend to do well, and before Ring Fit Adventure, I'm sure the first fitness boxing game was the premier Nintendo Switch fitness game. Next up is one that I'm actually very surprised by, Fire Emblem Warriors 3 Hopes. I forgot this game came out. Out. I was not tracking its development at all, and by the time it had released, I had virtually completely forgotten about it. When I heard people talk about Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes, I thought they were talking about one of the 3DS games for some reason. And keep in mind, I am a Fire Emblem fan. I just completely forgot this thing released. And also, the first Fire Emblem Warriors game has not sold a million units despite releasing much earlier, so I'm just all in all very shocked this one has managed to push it. That said, I know Fire Emblem has a very captive audience, especially in Japan, so a lot of those dead dedicated Fire Emblem fans probably went ahead and bought this one. And our last game that sits comfortably at the 1 million units mark is Enter the Gungeon, which is worth noting has not been updated since March 3rd of 2019, but this was a very early Switch indie, or at least in the release year of the console, which a lot of games that have sold very well have to say for themselves. Early in the console's life, people were buying pretty much anything that came out for it because there wasn't anything else to buy. I certainly bought Enter the Gungeon on Switch for that reason, and it's very good, but also really fucking hard. So I'm sure a lot of people who bought this game just expecting an easy, quick indie game definitely got their money's worth out of grinding runs indefinitely. 
Next up is our first game to push over a million documented units, which is Bayonetta 2 at 1.04 million. This game was a very early Wii U to Switch conversion before Nintendo started doing that left and right. I know a lot of dedicated Bayonetta fans were very angry that the first game was a Wii U exclusive, so I'm sure a lot of people who didn't get to play it initially jumped at the opportunity to finally have it on a more accessible console. Especially in the very long run-up to Bayonetta 3, people probably scooped this thing up. I am aware that this game had a limited or very scarce physical run, so if you own a physical copy of Bayonetta 2 on Switch, it might be a little rarer than some other games in your collection, and it's overall a very, very good game from a very, very good series that consistently manages comfortable, if not super explosive sales. Coming up next is a poor unfortunate soul of a game, which is Game Builder Garage, sitting at 1.06 million units. Now, this thing was obviously very bogged down by its non-existent game browser, requiring players to go on message boards and things like that to search for games, and while I'm confident the game would have sold much better if it had a more traditional game browser just to play other people's games. I can vaguely understand Nintendo not including that due to this primarily being marketed towards children, but at the same time, this is a somewhat low-key Nintendo release that just kind of came out of nowhere, and the fact that it managed to push 1.06 million units at all despite all of its shortcomings, I'd still say is a small win. Next up is a familiar face, being Bayonetta 3. Now sadly, we do have to acknowledge the Helena in the room here, which is the Bayonetta 3 voice voice actor controversy that bogged this game down just before release. I have not kept up on that since it first went down, so I do not know who's in the right and who's in the wrong here. I'm just here to look at the objective sales numbers, and 1.07 million units for a game that was this anticipated for so long is definitely a little bit of a surprise to see. I would have thought it would be hovering around 2 or 3 million, but there was an active boycott against this game, so it does make sense that less people bought it than they probably would have. Next up is one that I am very happy to see is Crack the List, which is is Metroid Prime Remastered. I'm not sure if this is specifically tracking all versions of the game or just a physical version, but 1.09 million units for a Metroid Remaster is a big deal. Metroid is a famously sales-challenged Nintendo series, and while it's had probably its best showing in a very long time on Switch, being bolstered significantly by Metroid Dread and the very positive word of mouth around this remaster, Metroid Prime managing to sell 1.09 million units is not too far off what it initially sold on GameCube, and is very, very cool to see. This is a very good game and deserves the solid sales numbers. Coming in next is Dr. Kawashima's Brain Training for Nintendo Switch. This one's pretty easy, people love casual games on the Nintendo consoles, and Brain Training has always been one of Nintendo's premier not-game games, where it's one of those things they market to families and older people who have access to the console, and it's always been very popular within that demographic. This series sold like 17 trillion units on Nintendo DS, so I am not surprised at all that the Switch iteration has managed to sell 1.20 million units. He's also also in Smash, which definitely helped. You'd better believe it, because next up is Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm Trilogy. This one's funny, because I actually bought it, despite not being a Naruto fan. This was, again, a super, super early Switch game. It released in July of 2017, and due to that, I bet a lot of people who were starving for games to play on the console picked this one up, and it's managed to do very respectably because of that. There's also, obviously, the captive Naruto fanbase, who's probably jumping at the opportunity to play this beloved anime licensed trilogy on the go, and because of that, 1.2 26 million units is not too much of a surprise. Our next game is WarioWare Get It Together, which sits at 1.27 million units. This is a game that I am certain would have sold more had it released two or three years earlier in the Switch's life. This thing got a ton of marketing and a ton of push from Nintendo, appearing at Nintendo Directs, getting all sorts of fully voice acted trailers and things like that. But sadly, by the time it released in 2021, the Switch was a very competitive landscape for first party minigame collections, and WarioWare simply didn't have the prestige to stand out. That said, it is also an infamously niche Nintendo side series, and 1.27 million units is still very respectable. Coming in next is Astral Chain, and I feel like this game kind of always had an uphill battle for sales. It was a new IP being released from Platinum Games as a hack and slash action game with a sort of stand or familiar system, which is a whole sort of combination of things that don't tend to perform very well. But that said, it was still a very, very solid, very cool, very hype game with all the flair and style you'd expect from a traditional Platinum Games game, and 1.28 million units is very respectable, especially considering the efforts of other Platinum 
Platinum games we've looked at on this list so far. Next up is the Resident Evil Revelations collection, which sits at 1.30 million units. This one is very easy. It released in November of 2017, was from a Prestige series, and was an early Switch game. So a lot of people were scooping this up just simply to get a Resident Evil game on the console. The Switch would end up being pretty comfortably supported for older Resident Evil games. Stuff like Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6 would end up releasing on the platform, and in some regions we'd get shitty cloud versions of Resident Evil 3, but the Revelations collection, I believe is currently the only installment in the series that has managed to make this list, and it was also initially a 3DS game, so it seems right at home on Nintendo platforms. Next up is a game or peripheral that doesn't exist anymore, the Nintendo Labo Toy-Con 01 Variety Kit, which despite being a bunch of cardboard, managed to sell 1.42 million units. This one's really interesting because it's one of, if not the only thing on this list, that Nintendo has fully phased out. You just can't get new Nintendo Labos straight from Nintendo anymore. This was obviously a big swing Nintendo took, you know, releasing a bunch of cardboard peripherals like craft at home, make your own fun kind of little activity kits for younger kids, and I feel like the gaming press was a little bit too hard on Labo. They were treating it like it was Nintendo's next big first party project, which it kind of was, but it was also never meant to be more than a humble thing for families and younger kids, and the fact that it managed to sell 1.42 million units for this initial kit is definitely respectable. That said, it is both not purchasable anymore, new, and is also likely in the trash from a lot of people who did buy it, so let's just hope for better things from Nintendo's next cardboard enterprise. Next up is a game that's very recently released, this time being Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe. This is the first game we have on the list that released this year, and it's managed to sell very comfortably in that amount of time. There are a lot of Kirby games on Switch, so the fact that consumer fatigue hasn't set in yet and people are still buying them is pretty cool, I like Kirby. Also, this game obviously has the nostalgic appeal of being a remake of a Wii game, all in all a perfect storm to sell a lot of units in very little amount of time. Next up is Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, which has sold 1.50 million units. Now, the MCU is obviously huge, especially with kids, and this is one that I feel like I never see the core Nintendo Switch Online community talking about. I never see this appear in lists about best Switch games or discussions about Switch games on the internet or anything. I feel like this is purely a game that more casual offline Switch fans and a lot of kids are playing. I very rarely see people discussing this thing, especially in recent years, but it's managed to sell very comfortable comfortably, and being a Marvel game with Spider-Man in it, that's a big deal, I'm honestly not surprised. Next up is a game I'm very surprised hasn't sold more units, which is Pokémon Tournament DX. Now, we'll get into this later on the list, but Pokémon games crush it on this system. They do so well. And Pokémon Tournament released in 2017, so I'm very surprised that it's only managed to push 1.54 million units. For the other games on the list so far, that makes sense, but for a Pokémon game, that's a really small number, even a spin-off. I think Pokémon has kind of an unsavory stigma around it, the core FTC kind of views it as a joke, and it being a Wii U game that didn't sell great definitely stunk it up by the time it finally came to Switch, but it's still a really fun fighting game with some really interesting and unique mechanics as far as the genre goes, and its selection of characters is really cool. I wish this game had sold more, and I honestly can't think of a reason why it hasn't, other than, again, the kind of unsavory stigma that Pokémon has in the general gaming space. Next up is another anime-licensed game that released very early in the Switch's life, being Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2. I actually don't know if the first Xenoverse game is on Switch, I'll have to double-check that, but it's very interesting to me that the second one has sold 1.55 million units, considering that these are games that rely on having played both to get the full experience out of them. Not only for the story, but there's also, like, save transferring and mechanics where you can bring content from the first game into the second one. It's a lot, and you're basically expected to play both of these. So the fact that the first one, if it's even on Switch, has not cracked this list, but the second one has comfortably, is pretty interesting to me. Though, once again, it did release in 2017, and it's from a very, very popular license, so it makes sense that it's done this well. Next up is another interesting one, being Mario Kart Live Home Circuit. This is a weird little thing that Nintendo put out during the pandemic, basically being an augmented reality RC car Mario Kart game that's managed to somehow sell 1.58 million units, despite retailing for close to $100, and from my memory being pretty scarce. This thing requires not only the upfront cost of purchasing it, but also a Switch, and a house big enough to actually play it with the augmented reality stuff and the RC car and things like that. It's 
a lot for what's effectively a flashy novelty, but I'd imagine this is very popular with younger kids who are into Mario. I know my nephew is, and he absolutely loved this thing, so I'm not surprised that it managed to do as well as it did. Next up is Big Brain Academy Brain vs. Brain. This is pretty much the exact same stuff I said about the Dr. Kawashima game earlier. Games like this do very well on Nintendo platforms, sold gangbusters on the DS and the 3DS, and are all around very, very popular with casual gamers and older folk alike. This one is a little more interesting though, because it did release, I think, significantly after the Dr. Kawashima game, and still managed to sell 1.59 million units. Pretty respectable, and I'm not surprised at all. Next up is Fire Emblem Engage, which currently sits at 1.61 million units as of this year. It is worth noting this is another game that released in 2023, but it's managed to do very, very well for itself so far. Despite being fairly contentious, I know some core Fire Emblem fans really don't like this one, and there's this whole thing about half of the game being bad and half of the game being good that I've been exposed to, but all in all, it's still a Fire Emblem game, and these tend to do very well, especially in Japan. Next up is a double whammy of turn-based RPGs, both sitting at 1.68 million units, being Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition and Miitopia. It's really funny that these are technically two games in the same genre on the same system, because I feel like their target demographics could not be more different. Xenoblade obviously appeals to the core JRPG anime crowd, which is totally fine, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but it's certainly not the kind of thing a casual consumer is just going to pick up and play right off the bat. It's still very, very good though, and as the name implies, is definitely definitely the definitive version of one of Nintendo's most underrated series, and Miitopia is basically the opposite. It is a very, very casual game that's carried by the novelty of putting your favorite characters and yourself and your friends and your family in the game. It's very, very silly, very quirky, very fun, and I feel like I always hear people hyping up the possibility of Tamadachi Life on Switch saying how this thing sold like 18 trillion units, but 1.68 million sales for a 3DS port is still a very respectable, and I think Nintendo should take it as an example for why Tamadachi Life would work on Switch. Which... And right after Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition is Xenoblade Chronicles 3, which sits at 1.86 million units. Now, with exception to the anime bad, JRPGs bad, long games bad, anime cringe crowd, you know, fucking cowards, I have heard nothing but good things about this game. This game did get a nomination for Game of the Year, and I have heard consistently amazing things about it from the people open-minded enough to actually give it a chance and play it. I've heard this is a phenomenal JRPG with great mechanics and a great story, and some really fun characters, and it doesn't come as a surprise at all that it is the second best-selling Xenoblade Chronicles game on Switch as a result of that. Coming in next is another double whammy of games sitting at 1.89 million units, being Taiko no Tatsujin Drum and Fun and Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team DX. Now, seeing Taiko on this list might be a little confusing to people who aren't familiar with the series, but rest assured, people fucking love Taiko. Taiko no Tatsujin is super, super popular, especially in Japan, and Drum and Fun specifically, I believe, is one of the first games in the series that's released in America in a very long time, so the fact that it sold 1.89 million units is perfectly reasonable. Pokemon Mystery Dungeon DX is again another Pokemon spin-off that I'm surprised hasn't sold more units, but the Mystery Dungeon series weirdly gets a lot of hateful reviews from bigger gaming critics who don't really understand the appeal of the series. You know, they'll say, oh, it's slow, and it's clunky, and it's boring, and it's juvenile, so it's bad, 2 out of 10, when they just don't understand what the series is or what it's trying to be compared to the core series. Rescue Team DX was another example of stuff like this, and I think if you give it a fair shake, you'll find a fun, charming little Pokemon spin-off with some fun stuff going on in it. Coming in next is Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle, which sits at 2 million units. And this one seems like kind of a misnomer to me, because you're constantly hearing about how mad Ubisoft is that Mario Plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope didn't sell well, and how it's so disappointing compared to the first game. And rest assured, 2 million units is certainly a lot, but for the Mario game that goes on sale the most on Switch, and one that you constantly hear about how great it is and how well it's sold, 2 million units really does not feel like that much. Sparks of Hope must have sold like 8 units for them to be as disappointed as they are in it, compared to 2 million. That said, Kingdom Battle is still very, very good. It's such an atypical Mario game, and the Rabbids actually aren't super, super annoying in this game compared to how they usually are, so I'd recommend this one. Next up is another anime licensed game, this time being Dragon Ball Fighter Z. And I'm not gonna mince words here, I love Dragon Ball Fighter Z. Along with Marvel vs. Capcom 3, it's probably my favorite traditional fighting game of all time, and it's just so fun and so good. It's so approachable from the perspective of someone who's never played a traditional fighting game before, and it's relatively easy to get good at compared to some other fighting games, or at least to a point where you can play online and actually participate. It's really fun, and the Switch version is really competent, with exception of slightly 
definitely worse netcode. I can't think of anything that was really compromised in the transition to Switch on this game. It's a really competent port that I've definitely put a lot of time into alongside the other versions of the game. 2.1 million units makes perfect sense for it. Next up is Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, which I feel is on this list solely because it is a Mario adjacent game that is very easy for parents to buy their kids for Christmas and birthdays and stuff. Also, it did once go on sale for only like two bucks at Walmart. There was like a bug in their system where Walmart was selling this game super cheap for some reason. It was resolved very quickly, but I know a lot of people scooped it up in that time. And I don't know if that's contributing to the sales numbers here, but if it is, it definitely bolstered it. Captain Toad Treasure Tracker is at the very least very good. I would say the Wii U and 3DS version are slightly better than the Switch version. The Switch version did have to make some concessions in terms of getting the gamepad functionality from the Wii U version to work, but it's still perfectly solid and a fun little Mario adjacent game. Next up is a game that was a Nintendo exclusive until it was an Octopath Traveler. Aside from a very what the hell type of title, this is a very, very standard, very uh, faithful by the numbers JRPG that doesn't offer too many concessions to people unfamiliar with the genre and how to play it. And that combined, I'm really surprised this game managed to push 2.16 million units on Switch. It did get a lot of press at Nintendo Directs going into its release, and it only released about a year and a half after the console, so that might make sense. But aside from that, this game really does doesn't have the genre prestige or early release of something like Xenoblade 2, so the fact that it's managed to sell this well is a little bit of a surprise to me. I guess it's gotta be really good. Next up is one that I'm sure people are very happy to see this high on the list, which is Pikmin 3 Deluxe. Now, there was a huge online push for everyone to buy this game so that Nintendo would continue supporting the Pikmin series, and if the recent push of Pikmin 4 and re-releases of 1 and 2 were anything to go by, then I think that that push worked out. Pikmin is one of the only Nintendo series that has its entire lineage represented on Switch, so I'm sure you guys who really wanted them to support it are very happy. That said, this is also a very, very good, incredibly unique series that's really on like anything else I've ever played, so the fact that something like this had managed to push 2.23 million units is very cool. Coming in next is Mario Golf Super Rush, which I've heard is not very good. I did not buy or play this game personally just because I'm not too into the Mario sports games, but I've heard pretty consistently mid to negative things about this game from core fans of both Mario Golf and the Mario Sports series as a whole, so the fact that it's managed to sell this well is a bit of a surprise, but that could just owe to it being a Mario game and both Nintendo fans and families with kids being willing willing to support anything with the Mario brand on it. That's not a knock against you guys, by the way, I usually do the same thing. But yeah, 2.35 million units for this game is a little high for the quality that I've heard it has, but it does make sense. Next up is Xenoblade Chronicles 2, which has managed to sell 2.44 million units. Now, this game released in 2017 and was one of the first big visible JRPGs on Switch, so that in no doubt owes to its massive success contextually compared to the rest of the series. It is worth noting that I've heard from core Xenoblade fans that while this game is very good and about as good as the rest of the series. It does have some problems with padding and fan service and generally being on some horny bullshit. So if anyone got a negative impression of the series of this game due to its sales being the only one that they bought, I would totally understand it. That said, I've heard it's still very good and its sales make perfect sense. Next up is another Mario sports game, this time being Mario Strikers Battle League. This is the game I feel was really the straw that broke the camel's back. People were getting fatigued with Nintendo releasing games that were very light on content but featuring online multiplayer as a replacement for content up to this point, and this game is really the one that I saw people fully fed up with that with. That said, for what it is, it's still a serviceable Mario Strikers game, not as good as Charge, but not terrible either, and the fact that it sold 2.54 million units is a testament to the fact that people generally are okay with it. Next up is the Progenerator for that Nintendo Online fatigue being ARMS. This game is a real testament to how long the Switch generation has gone on for. That very early in the console's life, this was a super visible game that Nintendo was pushing the hell out of. It managed to sell 2.66 million units and got a ton of post-launch support, and now just no one talks about it. It's seen as something from the past, even though it's still a part of the current console cycle. Nobody's really playing it anymore, nobody's buying this game new anymore. It really is kind of weird as how long the Switch generation generation has gone on for, and I feel like this game owes its success entirely to being released in 2017. This was a very early Switch game and a new IP. It was positioned to be the Switch's version of Splatoon, which it obviously wasn't, and Splatoon ended up being the Switch's version of Splatoon, but ARMS is still charming enough, has some fun characters, a fun world, and I'm not surprised it managed to sell as well as it did considering its release window. 
Coming in next is yet another Pokemon spinoff, this one being new Pokemon Snap. Out of all of the Pokemon spinoffs on Switch, I feel like this is the one that people wanted the most. Obviously, there have been clamoring for 20 years for a Pokemon Snap game, and then one came out and people just immediately forgot about it. Like, people wanted this game and they bought it and played it. It sold 2.74 million units, but I barely hear anyone discuss this game in retrospect now that it's out. It's one of those things where people spend years and years and years clamoring for a game, and then once they actually get it. They take it for granted and pretend like they always had it. It's hard to explain, but it is really a phenomenon that some games tend to go through, especially on Nintendo consoles. That said, New Pokemon Snap is very good. It's absolutely beautiful as far as Pokemon games on the Switch go, and the level of environmental detail and Pokemon animation detail are incredible. You could definitely go worse with Pokemon games on Switch. I like this one. Coming in next is another one that people are very happy to see this high, being Metroid Dread. This game has managed to push 2.90 million units, and is the gatekeeper for the 3 million units mark on this list, and is all around simply phenomenal. This is an amazing Metroid game, an amazing search action game, an amazing 2D game, an amazing pseudo-horror game, just an all-around amazing game. One that people spent years and years and years theorizing about and hoping would come out, and then when it finally did, it lived up to people's expectations in spades. It's just incredible incredible, and really helped to bolster the Metroid series image in the public eye. I feel like if this hadn't come out first, the Metroid Prime remake would have sold significantly worse, even though the Metroid Prime remake is also incredible. Metroid Dread just really reinvigorated the Metroid brand and people's excitement for it, which I fully appreciate. Great game, 2.90 million units is insane, absolutely deserved. But you know what's even more incredible? Yoshi's Crafted World, which has sold 3.1 million units. That was obviously a joke, I don't think Yoshi's Crafted World is any anywhere near as lovingly crafted, ironically, or as brilliantly designed as Metroid Dread. It's actually one of the only, like, big core Nintendo Switch games that I don't own, simply because I have no interest in it. It's not often for me to say this about Nintendo games, but I feel like I'm too old for Yoshi's Crafted World, if that makes sense. It feels markedly juvenile and childish in a way that Nintendo games don't typically tend to feel. Like, they're obviously childish, they're marketed to children, but Yoshi's Crafted World feels childish in a different way. That said, it's still definitely good. It's a fine enough 2D platformer, and the art style is definitely very unique. I can understand why this one sold as well as it did, especially for releasing in 2019. Next up is Among Us. There is no joke, it's just Among Us. It sold 3.2 million units, and it is a viral game that a lot of kids really like and a lot of YouTubers play, so it makes sense that it sold 3.20 million units. Next up is Paper Mario and the Origami King, which I feel like people are not going to be happy to see this high on the list. I actually don't mind Origami King, I think it's a fun alternative take on Paper Mario, and out of the post-classic era Paper Mario games, it's probably my favorite, but I can definitely see why it sold this well regardless. It is a Mario-adjacent game and a part of a series that people really enjoy. It also released during the pandemic. It was one of the only big Nintendo Switch games that was released during a year that notoriously had very few directs and very few big games. Games. Bear in mind, one of the only other major Nintendo games this year was a port of three older Mario games, so it makes sense that Origami King sold as well as it did. Next up is probably the biggest surprise on the list for me, which is Minecraft at 3.5 million units. I'm not surprised it sold this much, I'm surprised it sold this little. People like to disagree with this and come up with all sorts of technicalities as to why this isn't true, even though it is objective documented fact. Minecraft is the best-selling singular video game of all time. Out of all video games that cost money, Minecraft has sold the most units, and the Switch is the best-selling video game console that Minecraft is purchasable on, unless there's some port for PS2 or DS I don't know about. So the fact that not more of this game, several hundred million units, are on Switch, only 3.5, is a big surprise to me, especially with Switch's huge install base of kids. That said, the Switch version of Minecraft is perfectly fine, it's Minecraft, what can you really say? I'm definitely surprised for it to be this low, but not surprised at all that it's on the list at all. And for a good example of how comparatively few units Minecraft is sold on Switch, also at the 3.5 million mark is a Japanese exclusive game known as Momotaro Densetsu Showa Heisei Reiwa Motebon. I do not know what the series is, as I am not from Japan, but apparently it is a very popular, very prolific Japanese board game simulator that has sold a lot of units throughout its run. It's currently the 34th best-selling Switch game and tied with Minecraft despite being Japanese exclusive, so that's really impressive, good for the series. 
Next up is a bad game, being 1-2 Switch. Now, we all like to joke about how shitty this game is and how it should have been a pack-in and things like that, which are all absolutely true. But this game released on the day of the Switch. This was a launch title. And that is purely the reason that it has sold 3.63 million units. There was nothing else to buy on the Switch at launch, and no pack-in to demonstrate the capabilities of the console, so people bought this thing en masse. That's really all there is to it. Next up is a much better and much more understandable game, being Fire Emblem Three Houses, at 3.82 million units. This thing came out in 2019, was the first major Fire Emblem game on Switch, and received generally really, really good reviews from both core Fire Emblem fans and the general gaming press at large. It's very good, it's probably one of my favorite Fire Emblem games. The Three Houses mechanic in choosing your path is really fun, the characters are all really interesting as far as Fire Emblem goes. It's just a good game, I enjoy it, and I totally understand why it sold as much as it has. On to a somewhat less understandable game is The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword HD at 3.91 million units. For a game we all like to shit on for being a port of a Wii game that was full price at launch and for having its main functionality tied behind an expensive amiibo and everything like that, we definitely bought this game. I didn't, I got it for Christmas, but people definitely bought this game. I actually don't know how good it is compared to the Wii version because this is the only version I've actually played. I never owned Wii Motion Plus as a kid, but I like it plenty. I'm a little bit of a weirdo when it comes to Zelda. I've only played Breath of the Wild, Ocarina, Wind Waker, and the original NES version, and this obviously, but I enjoyed it plenty. I thought the motion controls were it took a little bit to get used to, but they were fairly unobtrusive and innovative once I did. I just kind of like this game, but I totally understand the negative press around it when it first came out. And coming in next is our gatekeeper for the 4 million mark being Kirby Star Allies. I love Kirby Star Allies for purely sentimental reasons. My my little nephew is currently six years old, and I've been playing video games with him for as long as he's been capable of playing video games, and one of the first games I remember us playing together was Kirby Star Allies. I know it's not a very great Kirby game, it's fairly uninspired and generic compared to what came before and after it, but I just have a lot of sentimental attachment to this game. I actually didn't even buy it for my nephew, I bought it because I wanted to buy games for my Switch, and he just ended up liking it a few years later. But I do have sentimental attachment to this game, so the fact that it sold 3.9 8 million units makes me happy. And coming in at 4 million units on the dot is Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. This is a game I heard kind of mixed things about. Obviously people knew it was a Warriors game, but even as far as those go, I heard some people did not like this one too much, and they thought what it did with the story was a little bit of a letdown. But the fact that it was a Zelda game, and also specifically a Breath of the Wild adjacent game, definitely got some people's attention, and I think really helped bolster this thing. There's a reason this is on the list, but the original Hyrule Warriors HD isn't. Age of Calamity simply exists to be a game to add to the Breath of the Wild mythos, and to that end I think it does an alright job. And swinging in next is one of the best 2D platformers of all time, being Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. This game is sold 4.12 million units on Switch and deserves every single one of those and more. You always hear people saying how good this game is, how great its level design, its music, its gameplay, its, its platforming, everything about this game is good. And I'm here to co-sign on that. Tropical Freeze is really good. If you're turned off because it's not Mario or you think it's too difficult, I would strongly encourage you to power through because this is a one-of-a-kind 2D platformer. Platformer. It is simply sublime, and I think the incredibly positive word of mouth, coupled with its relatively early release in May of 2018, really helped bolster this thing and get it into more hands. Another really good and somewhat underrated Switch game is Clubhouse Games 51 Worldwide Classics, which sits at 4.22 million units. This game's really good, it's just a fun little collection of virtual tabletop games with a lot of variety and a lot of really fun stuff to play. I really like Dots and Boxes. It's so simple and accessible that I'm surprised more people haven't given it a chance as a sort of gateway casual game for the Switch, and I think that its general approachability and accessibility have really helped sell it to people who might not be too interested in video games otherwise. Next up is one of the most interesting cases on this list, being Mario Tennis Aces, which is a game I feel owes its success entirely to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. This game is sold 4.28 million units and released in June of 2018, which was right around the time Smash Ultimate was revealed. To a lot of people, this game was sort of like a fighting game adjacent thing by Nintendo that they could play to tide them over until Smash Ultimate released. Think about it, a lot of the press around this game and YouTube videos you saw of it had people joking that it was a fighting 
fighting game and featured fighting game adjacent mechanics, and it was all over until Smash Ultimate released, and then people just kind of stopped talking about it. I think people bought this game purely to tide them over in the one-on-one -on -one competitive Nintendo game market until Smash Ultimate came out. Otherwise, it's still a very, very good game, probably one of the best Mario sports games on Switch, and one of the only ones that feels like a complete package, so it's very cool. Next up is one of the many Zelda games I've played and enjoyed but haven't beaten being Link's Awakening, which currently sits at 6.8 million units. I have a bit of a hot take, I really like how this game looks. I know a lot of people really don't like the art style, but I think when you get around that, it's a very aesthetically pleasing game with some really clean textures and beautiful lighting and water effects. It's just a really pretty game. Aside from that, it's a faithful and well-adapted remake of one of Zelda's first handheld adventures, and a game that I feel a lot of people bought simply because they thought it looked cool. There's not a big reason why it sold as well as it has, other than being a Zelda game that people wanted to play, and I respect that. It's worth noting that we're at the point in the list now where the numbers start jumping around a lot. For reference, Mario Tennis Aces was 4.28 million, and Link's Awakening was 6.8 million. Our next one, Kirby and the Forgotten Land, is 6.46 million. Kirby and the Forgotten Land is sublime. It may be a little more simple and a little more faithful to the normal Kirby formula than people would have wanted from the first 3D Kirby game, but I still really enjoy it. I think it's a very fun, very relaxing, and very soothing game with some really fun mechanics and boss fights that effortlessly adapts the Kirby formula to 3D. I think the fact that this was marketed as the first 3D Kirby game definitely helped bolster its numbers, as well as the fact that Kirby games just tend to do well on the console. And I believe this is also the best-selling Kirby game to date. I'll have to check, but I know this is definitely up there. Overall, a good game that deserves its sales. Next up is a game that was also a Nintendo exclusive until it wasn't, being Monster Hunter Rise. Now, Monster Hunter is absolutely gargantuan in Japan, and even to an extent in America with a more underground fan base. so I'm not not surprised at all that this thing has managed to push 7.70 million units. Um, that said, I don't play it too much myself. I was really into it when it first came out, primarily because my ex-girlfriend played a lot of it, and after me and her broke up, I haven't really played it since. Sorry to trauma dump in this YouTube video about Nintendo games, but it was my first ever Monster Hunter game at the point that I had played it with her, and the fact that I was able to get into it with her despite it being my first game in the series is a testament to how approachable it is for new players. It's really good, and one that I definitely recommend playing to people who haven't gotten into the series before, especially now that it's on every other platform and PC. We're getting into the big hitters now with Super Mario Maker 2. This is one that I'm not surprised at all is this high on the list, and honestly expected to be a bit higher. This game is gargantuan on YouTube, even to this day. There are so many YouTubers who make their livings playing people's levels and challenging themselves with increasingly difficult ones, and sharing their levels and playing viewer levels and stuff like that. This is a big YouTube community game. Even aside from that, it's just so fun to browse levels and play them with friends and family, even make your own, which is something that I was never terribly into, but I know is a lot of people's favorite thing about this series. I'm more about the playing side of things, but if you're into the building, I absolutely understand. It's just really fun, and I know it's especially popular with kids. My nephew absolutely loves the series, and loves watching YouTube videos about it. It's a market improvement from the first Mario Maker game that improved pretty much everything about it, and added a ton of new features, even if it was obvious that pre-pandemic they were intending to add a full-on Mario 2 mode. Even with that, it's still a very very good game that is worth the 7.89 million units. Next up is one that would be a lot higher if Nintendo was smart. Super Mario 3D All-Stars. Let's not mince words here. If not for the limited release strategy, this thing would be probably in the top 15. It would certainly be in the top 20, which it sits outside of right now. This is a port of three of the best games of all time, faithfully adapted and made to play like nothing has ever changed. Mario Galaxy is a little rough due to its controls, but the other two are perfectly fine, and Mario Galaxy is still playable if you get used to it. I've put a lot of time into the 3D All-Stars version, versions of all three of these games, and the fact that it's a re-release of Sunshine, specifically, is huge. I would say it's cool to have this game finally available again after years of being stuck on GameCube, but it's not available anymore. Thanks, Nintendo. Either way, 9.7 million units makes perfect sense, either for FOMO or just the quality of the three games included. Next up is one that, until right now, I had no idea performed this well, being Nintendo Switch Sports at 9.60 million units. I feel like you hear people all the time saying that this game was a flash in the pan 
man and then it died. But with numbers like that, I'm certain there are still people playing this game online in a dedicated fashion. I know we're all really upset about this game, that it's a sham of its former self and that it's nothing like Wii Sports, but 9.60 million units doesn't lie, and people's faithfulness to Nintendo sports games and the Wii Sports brand specifically definitely helped carry this thing way farther than it would have if it was under any other name. Next up is a game that came out like two weeks ago and is already in the top 20, being The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, which is currently at 10 million units and likely climbing. This entry will likely become outdated very fast. I'm sure in a few days, Nintendo will announce that the game has broken 20 million or 25 million or what have you, but either way, it's the sequel to Breath of the Wild, often considered one of the, if not the best game of all time, and in the past generation, one of the best things that's ever been made in general, so the fact that it's doing this well is not a surprise at all. Expect this entry to get outdated very, very quickly. I'll leave a pinned comment once that happens. Coming in next is Mario Party Superstars at 10.17 million units. I actually really like this game. I think it's probably the best Mario Party game we've had in a long time. I think it was built for DLC, which Nintendo never did for some reason, despite the fact that people did data mine that there was open space in the game's data for DLC. I have no idea what happened to this game. It's not entirely out of the realm of possibility that Nintendo randomly picks it up again like they did with Mario Kart 8, considering its sales. But either way, it's a very solid game, and considering the Mario Party series prestige, and again, people's willingness to support anything with the Mario brand on it, I'm not surprised this game has cracked 10 million units. Next up is another fairly recent game, being Splatoon 3 at 10.67 million units. This is one of those games you heard a million stories about it being a rollicking success right out of the gate. Like, you heard a lot about it raising Nintendo's stock price and being the fastest selling game of all time for like two days and stuff like that. It just did really, really well right out of the gate, and proved a lot of people who said there wasn't a market for two Splatoon games on the same console very wrong very quickly. Splatoon is quickly becoming one of Nintendo's most prestige franchises, despite its relatively young age, and I think it absolutely deserves to be where it's at. It's a fun, unique answer to a shooter, and Splatoon 3 being a sequel to the current best-selling game in the series definitely has earned it its sales. Coming up next is one of my personal favorite games for the Switch, being Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. This one was definitely helped by being revealed at the same Direct that revealed Mario 3D All-Stars, but it's also just a really solid port of 3D World that introduces a lot of great quality of life features and a ton of fun new control options. The Bowser's Fury mode absolutely bolsters this thing. We've been hearing this generalized sentiment among the Nintendo community for a while that Bowser's Fury is the model that the next full 3D Mario game should be built on, and if that turns out to be be true, then it will have absolutely made the wait between them worth it, because Bowser's Fury really rules. Overall, Mario 3D World is really, really good, and while I can't think of a reason for it selling this well other than just being a Mario game, sometimes being a good Mario game is all you need. Next up is another great Mario-adjacent game on Switch, this time being Luigi's Mansion 3 at 12.82 million units. I love Luigi's Mansion 3, and I'm really happy it sold this well. This game was helped a lot by releasing right around Halloween, so a lot of people bought it for some seasonally spooky Halloween fun, and it's also just really good. It's got some of the best graphics and presentation on Switch, it's probably the best looking Mario adjacent thing on the console, and its plethora of post-launch support, while not major in terms of the game itself, definitely helped give it some longevity in the public eye. This is just a cool game that I'm really happy to see succeeding as much as it has. Next up is the game that started it all by continuing it all, Splatoon 2 at 13.30 million units. Splatoon 2 is huge for the Switch. It was one of the first big visible exclusives on the console, and I know was the game a lot of people were buying it for pre-Mario Odyssey. It released in July of 2017, so it was right after the Switch, and I thoroughly believe that this game releasing in such close proximity to the console really helped push units early on. The Switch has been really successful overall, and it owes a lot of that to Splatoon. It had a huge burden to shoulder releasing this early, and it fulfilled its duty with flying colors. It's also just a really good game, and while it might be a bit outdated now that Splatoon 3 is out, the Octo expansion and the single player definitely still gives it some degree of replayability. The only other thing really of note is that this game was steadily being pushed out of the top 10 best-selling games on Switch for a while, and only just recently fully dropped out of it. Either way, a great game that did its job and then some. We're about to have a bit of a Pokemon spree here, starting with Pokemon Legends Arceus at 
3 million units. I am shocked that this game is sold as well as it has, considering the performance of other Pokemon spinoffs we've had on the list. And while this game is technically main series, I do feel like it had a bit of a burden to shoulder in terms of selling its concept to people as a new take on Pokemon. That said, it did it quite well. Despite people's complaints about the graphics, this game I've heard consistently is one of the best games in the Pokemon series. And while I barely had time to play it myself, what I've seen of it looks really interesting and innovative as far as Pokemon goes. I think as far as the sales go, it simply has to do with it being a Pokemon game and releasing in close proximity to another one, which allowed a lot of people to fill their yearly quota for Pokemon quite handily. Overall, not a shock at all that it's where it is. And next up for Pokemon is Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. I know a lot of people don't really like these games, they view them as downgrades from the original and kind of soulless. I'm personally not as down on them as others, they're not my favorites, but I don't absolutely hate them. The sales don't lie though, at 14.92 million units across both versions. This puts us at kind of an impasse, considering that the Pokemon games, despite releasing as pairs, have their sales tracked as one, so this is technically split between both Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, and that'll go for every other pair of Pokemon games on the list. As far as the sales numbers go, remakes of Gen 4 were wanted and rumored for a long time, and despite people not being terribly happy with these ones, one thing we'll learn about Pokemon in this video is that despite people's misgivings with the graphics or gameplay, they will always buy Pokemon en masse. Overall, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl make perfect sense to be this high on the list in general, but also this low as far as the Pokemon games go. Next up in our Pokemon spree is Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. I feel like these games have kind of a weird reception and legacy these days. People hated them when they came out. They thought they were so bad. But now that we've had Pokemon games that people have reacted more negatively to in retrospect, people are looking back on these games and saying, maybe I treated you too harshly. Regardless, I've always been a bit higher on Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee than others. I prefer Fire Red and Leaf Green as far as Gen 1 remakes go, but I think graphically and musically, these are far and away the best Pokemon games on Switch. They don't have that roughness or jank that some other modern Pokemon games have. Otherwise, these being remakes of Gen 1 that tied into Pokemon Go and were released with an exclusive peripheral definitely helped bolster their numbers, and they currently sit at 15.7 million units, all things considered. Taking a break from Pokemon for a bit, we have Ring Fit Adventure, which sits at 15.38 million units, released in October of 2019, and was just in time for an exercise game during the pandemic. I will once again say, let's not mince words, this game sold this well because of the pandemic. People needed a fun, engaging way to stay in shape while they were cooped up in their homes, and Ring Fit was just there having released immediately before like a shining beacon of hope. So many people were able to stay significantly healthier than they would have otherwise during the pandemic thanks to this game, and while its effectiveness as an actual workout tool I know has been questioned, it at the very least got people moving and gave them something to get out of bed for every morning to keep their routine up, which I genuinely appreciate. I think these health-conscious but also fun Nintendo games are really cool and only come around once in a while, so Ring Fit Adventure is definitely an important game in that regard. There is another pandemic era Nintendo game we'll discuss later in this list that I think we all know, but to begin our top 10, we could go worse than Ring Fit Adventure. And our award for the least deserving game in the top 10 goes to New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. This game has sold 15.41 million units just ahead of Ring Fit, but I personally think hovering around the 2 or 3 million mark would make more sense. While I don't hate this game, I think it's perfectly playable. It is an aggressively average port of a Wii U game that didn't have its gameplay or level design updated enough to accommodate for the new stuff they added. The new content, like Peachette and the Super Crown, were very poorly thought out, ultimately making the game too easy if you use them, and if you weren't, then your inventory was just cluttered with a bunch of super crowns you couldn't use, and it contributed to a certain internet meme. That said, it is Mario, and as far as a casual consumer goes, a 2D Mario platformer is definitely easier to grasp than some of the Mario things we've looked at on this list so far. So for me, this is the ultimate casual gamer Mario pick for the video. It makes perfect sense considering that, that it's in the top 10. Next up is another maybe undeserving game, though I'm a little lighter on this than New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe being Super Mario Party. This game has sold 19.14 million units and released in October of 2018, so it wasn't too long after the release of the Switch. It was still in the first two years. This game was perceived as a big return to form for Mario Party when it first came out, and while it wasn't exactly that, Mario Party Superstars would be more of that later on, I can definitely see why a lot of people nostalgic for or just hungry for a more traditional Mario Party game 
everything gravitated towards this. That said, now that Mario Party Superstars is out, there's not too much reason to go back to this one. They did update it with online play like three years after it came out for what it's worth, and if you really want to play it, that is a way to get more money out of it. But otherwise, 19.14 million units definitely does seem a bit extreme for this game. Back into the Pokemon zone for a bit are Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, sitting at 22.10 million units. These ones broke all sorts of sales records for things like units sold in the fastest amount of time and things like that, and they overall obviously did very, very well. People were still really angry about them for their graphics and bugs and things like that, but that did not stop the money train from rolling, let me tell you. That won't be the last time we say it on this list either. This being the first major big open world Pokemon game definitely helped it. I think if this was a traditional Pokemon game that released looking and playing like it did, it wouldn't have sold as well, but people were definitely enticed by it being open world and being a new step for the series. Overall, I understand why these ones sold as well as they did, but there is one more Pokemon game standing in their way from the top. But standing between those two Pokemon games is Super Mario Odyssey. And it may be a little surprising to see this only at number 6. This seems like a big contender for top 3, but then you look at what the top 3 actually are, and you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Either way, Super Mario Odyssey is such a phenomenal game. It is one of the best 3D Mario games ever made, and fully innovated on what 3D Mario can be. It's so phenomenal, and the praises of it have been sung so many times already. This is also a really visible early Switch game, releasing in October of 2017. If Splatoon is what people bought the console for, this is what people bought the console from Scalpers from, if that makes sense. People needed a Switch to play Super Mario Odyssey. The marketing for this game was absolutely incredible, with things like Jump Up Superstar and the T-Rex trailer and things like that, and overall, it absolutely deserves to be in the top 6. 25.76 million units is no joke. Kicking off our top 5 is the ultimate testament to why boycotts don't work, being Pokemon, Sword, and Shield. What happened to Dexit, guys? What happened to the National Dex controversy? What happened to the graphics? What happened to all that? Sure looks like 25.82 million of you guys bought it. You can't hide that from me. Jokes aside, Pokemon, Sword, and Shield obviously had a lot of negativity going their way when they first came out, but as we've learned, people will ultimately buy Pokemon either way. People are just too loyal to the series to truly give up on it, no matter how lackluster the games ultimately end end up being. I'm actually not as down on Sword and Shield as others, I think it's really fun to replay and do Nuzlocke's of, and it's ultimately a game that I can definitely see why it sold as well as it did. It being the first big main console Pokemon game, while also working to its detriment as people felt it didn't look up to the par it should have, it also really helped bolster it, people wanted to see what a main console non-handheld Pokemon game could be, and it just all around a game that exists and sold 25.82 million units. Kicking off our top 4 is the game that started it all, Legend of Zelda. Zelda Breath of the Wild at 29.81 million units. This is the game. This is the game that proved to everyone that the Switch was here to stay. It was not a joke and it was not going to be another Wii U. Nintendo hit the ground running by releasing this game as a launch title and fully demonstrating that the Switch was not a cheap novelty or a gimmick. When I was working at McDonald's when this game first came out and wasn't able to get a Switch, people coming in with them and playing them in the break rooms was like witchcraft to me. Breath of the Wild was the game that proved what the Switch could do. It is one of the best games of all time, easily top 10 games on the console, probably top 1 depending on who you ask, and is simply divine. It has earned every single one of those sales and more. Our number 3 is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate at 31.9 million units. This is also the game that demonstrated that Nintendo wasn't playing around in the Switch generation. While it came out a bit later than Breath of the Wild, obviously, it wasn't a launch title, it took almost 2 years to release, this was the game that really legitimize Super Smash Bros. as a serious competitor in the gaming space. And I know what you might be thinking, Smash had been that way for a long time. Maybe with consumers, but not to other developers. When Snake and Sonic got into Brawl, it was a big deal, and when Cloud got into Smash 4, that was an even bigger deal. But Ultimate was when the roof was fully blown off of the Super Smash Bros. house, and demonstrated that getting into the series was a privilege and an earned right for video game characters and companies. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is the ultimate gaming crossover. There is not and will never be another piece of gaming media that fully demonstrates a developer's love and adoration for the media in the way that Super Smash Bros. Ultimate does. For that, I love this game and think that it deserves every sale and more. 
our number two is Animal Crossing New Horizons, which, if I may be hyperbolic, I think might be the single most important video game that's ever released from a greater cultural perspective. Like, obviously games that released early on, like Pong and Pac-Man, are important for shaping video games, but in terms of affecting the greater cultural consciousness, none have really been as important as Animal Crossing. This game was delayed and released the week the pandemic started. Obviously not the week it started, but the week people really took notice. That made this game into a phenomenon. People needed a way to distract themselves, needed a way to stay chipper and upbeat during the pandemic. They needed a happy dose of normality to keep them sane, and Animal Crossing was there to answer the call. 42.21 million units later, and it has solidified itself as one of Nintendo's best. I know a lot of people take issue with some of its mechanics, and that it took a while to get really, really good with updates and stuff, but that really doesn't matter. What this game represents and what it did for a pandemic era consumer is more important than that. This is probably one of the most important games Nintendo has ever released in terms of a greater cultural consciousness, and I think that it's fully earned being the number two best-selling Switch game. And number one is... Mario Kart. Yeah, it's Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, who would've guessed? This game has sold 53.79 million units and is one of the best-selling games of all time. That said, there's really not much to say about it. It's Mario Kart. I know, it's kind of a limp way to end the video, right? We had Breath of the Wild, this game that legitimized the Switch and started a generation. We have Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, the ultimate gaming crossover. We've got Animal Crossing New Horizons, a game that helped keep people sane during a pandemic. And then just Mario Kart. You know, it's it's Mario Kart. It's good, and it's fun, but I feel like this game being number one is emblematic of a lot of things about the Switch generation. That people are comfortable just buying safe, familiar things rather than branching out. That games like Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, a port of a sequel of a Mario series, is the number one best-selling game on the console, whereas some more innovative or original stuff is near the bottom or not even on the list at all. The Switch generation has been defined by familiarity and comfort. There's been so many ports and re-releases that people have definitely taken notice and taking issue, but I don't really think there's anything wrong with that. To me, while the Switch obviously isn't a powerhouse, and it's certainly outdated hardware-wise these days, the level of comfort and familiarity I feel when I play on my Switch is unbridled. It's such a comfy little machine that just makes me happy to use, and nothing embodies that better than Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Hey, thanks for watching. I know this video was really long, but that's what happens when you talk about 80 plus games in a single video. If you enjoyed and want to see more of this, please let me know. I'd be down to do more videos like this for other consoles, because Wikipedia literally has a list for like every major console ever published. That said, I hope you enjoyed, hope you have a fantastic day before, during, and after watching, and I'll catch you all later. Thanks and cheers.